Welcome to season four of the Retail Tea Break podcast. My name is Melissa Moore, the Retail Advisor, and each week I'll be joined by industry experts, retailers and product creators to decode the myths, share knowledge and give you an insight into the retail industry. So grab your cup of tea, sit back, relax and listen in to season four of the Retail Tea Break podcast. Today I'm joined by a guest who is an ephemeral retailing specialist. Currently working as a senior consultant for Universe Retail in Paris, her retail career started in the fashion industry. Now, with over two decades experience, she's worked closely with fashion brands at retail and management levels. This researcher and marketing and retail lecturer has international retail uh, teaching experience, having attended universities and business schools in Beirut, Istanbul, London, and Paris. Her research and publications cover retail, fashion management, and ephemeral retail. Galea Busiani, welcome to the Retail Tea Break podcast. Hello, Melissa. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy to be with you today. <laughs> I'm so pleased we're getting to sit down and I already know and my apologies in advance now for everyone listening and watching is that your background, especially your academic background in retail is really what draws me in here and I've been reading some of your articles so I am so excited as someone that's kind of moved into that educational piece. I am so excited to be chatting to you today. So Let's start off in the way we always do on the Retail Tea Break podcast, in the time that it takes to boil a kettle, which I'm told is two minutes. Tell us about you and then what sparked your interest in pop-up stores. Well, um, it was a gloomy day in 2009 (laughs) when I had to choose actually a topic for my thesis. Um, And then I was really looking at all these retail formats at the time um, related to concept stores, um, lots of vintage uh, shopping uh, emerging, um, especially in Notting Hill, like we were reading all of these beautiful articles about these beautiful stores. But then um, I was wondering, uh, would it be relevant for me to study something that already has been studied and researched by many? So I take the tube and uh, I pick up uh, one newspaper, the ones that we used to like take on the (laughs) The free ones, (laughs) the the free ones, ones. exactly. And I open the page and it's really like um, in a very um, um, simple way. I start like looking at the pages and then suddenly um, I fall on an article saying like uh, the new uh, pop-up store is opening uh, in East London pop-up store I mean the name is so weird what is this store let me go and like uh, look at this topic so I sat down like for five or ten minutes um, I was intrigued and then in the evening I came back and did some research and I said like wow this is something that is going to be big let me maybe suggest uh, this topic for my thesis and let me start looking at pop-up stores I think this is the future of retail I was really excited at the time (laughs) but I'm still (laughs) are that's crazy because that was years ago I mean that was so long ago and I think it's probably going to surprise a lot of listeners and a lot of watchers that actually the term or even the actual shop version mm. of a pop-up shop in our main streets and our high streets and in, in our shopping centers has been around for so long because it seems like a very new thing. Exactly. Uh, I'm even surprised uh, when I talk to people uh, or me, maybe we would say we have the tendency uh, to say that older people or generation are not acquainted with new retail yeah. formats. Or maybe our generation might be less acquainted if they are into shopping or less into shopping. However, when I go sometimes to teach, um, I have maybe 10 or 15 years difference between uh, the students that I'm teaching. And when I ask them about pop-up stores, many uh, say that they don't know what it is or haven't visited a pop-up store. But looking back at at history, uh, retail history, pop-up stores have been there for quite some time. If I had discovered them in 2008, they had already been there since 1999. But the thing is that in 2008, the recession began and yeah. it hit Europe. 
and the high street needed something new and different. Pop-up stores appear to be like the um, saviors of uh, retail and retail format. And it was a good instance or a good moment to say like, okay, there is a crisis on the high street. Uh, the high street needs something to shake it up and pop-up stores at appear to be like the like the um, horse uh, what, what do we say uh, the the shining um, they're like a shining saviors. beacon at the moment aren't yes. they yeah absolutely <laughs> they're drawing the people in supposedly exactly exactly so like 2008 is that uh, I believe uh, important instance that we should look at when it comes to pop-up stores that's amazing. Again, I'm really shocked that, as you said, they've been around so long at this stage, but I suppose they they screamed, they came kicking and screaming onto the market back for the recession. And there seems to have been that re-emergence again, now kind of mm. post-COVID years. But you've written incredible. And again, I'm going to pop the links into the show notes. I find them absolutely incredible academic papers on ephemeral stores or pop-up stores, as we're calling them today. So from your point of view, tell us what what makes a pop up store? What is a pop up store? Um, I'm inclined to say that uh, pop up stores could be easily confused with seasonal stores or other temporary stores. So to stay away from this confusion, it's very important to put up a mix of several ingredients together to make up a pop up store. To be eligible to be called a pop up store, uh, this physical or uh, online format should be appearing in a very specific time and timing with a chosen location that speaks to a target audience and that has something different in terms of retail atmosphere, something that gives it an added value. Uh, and most importantly, if a pop-up store should be called a pop-up store, it's because it presents customers with lots of activities um, or actually events that makes it more dynamic uh, and less dull or less um, dull. I think yeah, great dull and boring. And dull. Exactly. Um, putting these all together is important and on top of all of these uh, variables that I have listed, uh, it's very important that a pop-up store, one or many, have to have a clear objective because you cannot confuse uh, pop-up stores uh, with other stores. You have to have a very clear objective to what you intend to deliver or communicate through that instance. Therefore, uh, having this objective would guide you into everything related to the creation of the physical atmosphere and all of the events that you will be adding on to give life to that atmosphere. Ah, so I'm sitting here thinking, this is interesting. We've had an explosion in Ireland of pop-up stores, and now I'm going to use that term quite loosely, because actually what you're describing is exciting, has events. It isn't just a temporary retail store, which I think an awful lot, again, a lot of listeners will be thinking that's the version I think many of us have become used to seeing. Uh, actually, yes. We had uh, come across a period when pop-up stores became very vulgarized. I mean, let's open up a store from uh, December 7th to December 28th. Let's put uh, our products, like take advantage from the season, uh, like the Christmas or end of year season um, or period, and let's sell our products. But does this really um, make from that instance a pop-up store? Not at all, because there are lots of other factors that we're missing here. Um, if this is called a pop-up store, then what do we call a seasonal stand? If we call this a pop-up store, then what do we call a Christmas fair? Or So these questions have to be really raised. And at some point we got, uh, we used that term in a very vulgarized way. And I use mm. the term vulgarized because every time we uh, appeared for a limited period of time, uh, we said like, yes, we're doing a pop-up store. However, we failed to integrate all of the other elements related to communications, adding on events, um, getting in touch or closer with the audience. Um, maybe informing, teaching, experiencing, experimenting, all of these things 
have to be our essential parts or integral parts of a pop-up store's composition. And when they are not there, it does not mean that we're doing a pop-up. So this is really important. That is interesting. And I think maybe that's one of these key pieces of, of the jigsaw that is missing for an awful lot of these. And again, to use the term, the vulgar way an awful lot of us are using the term pop-up stores. But you use the word magical in one of your publications. And this, this got me excited because again, and now having heard you explain the real term pop-up and, and what it should look like, they should be magical. Like they should be exciting. It's about, I suppose, for the consumer capturing that moment in time. And then of course, no wonder then the consumer wants to be part of it. So apart from going to buy from the brand, is it the atmospherics then um, that drive us to go and explore in these pop-ups? Or are we going because our friends are going, because it's almost become quite tribal, that it's the place to be seen, to take our Instagram shot, to do our TikTok dance or whatever it might be. Um, do we need to go and hang out there? Or what? what is it? Why are we going, do you think? Um, it's very interesting that you have raised that, that question and it's very normal for us to um, go into that um, line of thought. Um, at, when we were young or when we have uh, youngsters at home, we tend to sit with them and read a book. And then when we read a book, they would imagine all the, all the scenes, all the um, elements that we have been uh, talking about and they would have to create uh, or envision that scene in their heads. Now with a store, we are trying to tell a story and instead of um, letting you do the effort to imagine it, we're also putting you in a context, in an imaginative context for you to live it. It's really important then to see that the space would um, elevate from being a simple place of presentation to being really an immersive and engaging space. In that sense, everything that I have put for you, all of these atmospheric variables, I have put them for you to engage with them, to feel, to smell, to touch, and then to interact, to, re to react. I'm giving you the possibility to be your own hero when you're visiting that store. This being said, with pop-up stores, brands have gone one step further with their relationships with clients, telling them that if you go to my uh, location on Regent Street or on Oxford Street, I wouldn't allow you to be uh, freely moving into the store. But when you come to my pop-up store, like you're really free to do whatever you want. Like we're breaking those rules. So to um, add some uh, more information on everything that you have uh, raised earlier, when we go to a store, there are three variables that we study in academia, but we can see like as consumers, the ambience, design and social factors. The social factor like the human or people factor is a really important uh, variable that pop-up stores have uh, invested in dearly because they know if customers go and experience what they are experiencing alone or with others, alone with others and with the brand, they would create a greater sense or a stronger sense of community. What you have called tribe could be something that we manifest more or less when we go into a store. This is a decision that the brand uh, takes and hence the idea of having a clear objective before going into a pop-up store uh, um, project. And it gives the customer this sense of um, communicating with the brand and being at closer proximity at the brand. And if customers are having this beautiful uh, feeling, which allows them to live that story and create their own moment of magic through the digitalization of the store, I give them also the opportunity to have their own voice communicated online or within the store. So yes, there is this Instagrammable wall somewhere behind me because I want my customer to give their opinion. Are you happy? Take a picture, post it, tag your friend, tag me, and I will reach it. It's a, always a win-win uh, situation for customers. They feel that like, yeah, I can do whatever I want with the brand, but with the brand, we're creating for him user-generated content, which is really good. 
Moreover, I would like to add that brands take this opportunity to get closer to customers. Today, we have a lot of data that we collect on the market, but this hot on the spot data is more valuable than any other statistical data that I could have collected anywhere else or bought from third parties. So if brands are clever enough, they would use every instance of the customer's journey inside the store and try to also get qualitative uh, output from, from him uh, to make sure that they have really understood what their customers are thinking, feeling, and help them enhance their next or upcoming action. I hope I didn't talk a lot. <laughs> no, I, I have to say, and I know you can't see me at home the way my mind is now traveling at a million miles an hour, kind of thinking of that and actually realizing that the huge benefits, and I don't just mean on the surface of having a pop-up store and it generating money for the brands, but the freedom it gives the creative team, the design team to be able to really, truly express themselves based on the brand's values, um, setting up. And, you know, a truly immersive pop-up store is incredible for a part of the creative team. But as you say, this really lets the brand see how the impact, you know, how their brand can really impact the consumer live in front of them. As you say, if a, com a consumer is free to explore, to express themselves, to really interact with the product or the brand, you know, that's that's gold dust. That's something you can't buy in marketing. Um, so the true meaning of a pop-up here, if it's done well by the sounds of it, pays off dividends. Like there's your return on investment straight away. Mm. And more than that, uh, I would say like return on investment, yes, if your initial objective was to, was to sell. Yeah. However, sometimes um, developing a pop-up store project would be to create other types of returns. So maybe we should also think of return on experience. Return on experience is a new term that allows brands to also calculate differently because the investment of a pop-up store could be seen as an investment as a new retail format, but also a marketing spend. It really depends on how the brand is initially calculating uh, their pop-up store initiatives. Are they considering them as uh, legitimate as any other uh, point of contact? Or are they testing them and therefore considering them under their marketing spend? So today also we should, we should be really careful uh, when we have set initially these um, objectives uh, of our pop-up store, are we calculating something in particular related to sales or do our sales or effects translate in another channel? And this comes to raise another question in that omni-channel context, if a brand has many touch points, should I be naive and go and to my manager and tell him I'm going to calculate how my pop-up stores did here, right here, right now? Or if I had included um, outlets uh, to allow my customers to experience something in the pop-up store and purchase from the online site or the physical store, am I allowed to calculate a return on investment related to the pop-up store? So food for thought. I wouldn't be able to answer this or that because it always depends on the pop-up store itself and the actions uh, that we need to take and what we what results we are hoping to get from that action. That that's a really great lesson, and I actually think that's a really great basic retail lesson that I think we're so we're so driven these days to just you know just just look at sales, look at the bottom line, look at that kind of churn of cash coming through. But as you say, like the return could be: Are we having a true digital experience? Is it a true omni-channel experience? What was that initial objective? And it comes back to that initial thing you said of. Why are we doing this? Whereas certainly pop-ups I've been into recently, it, the, the boring ones, and I hate to call them that, that, that really are just there for kind of brand awareness and making sales. But it's lovely then that the true meaning of pop-up is about looking at these other data points. And again, when you have the data, 
turning in the right way when it's coming through to the single source of looking at this customer and what they need from us again it's gold dust and I think it's incredible that we can use these pop-ups in such a new way and be allowed to do that as retailers that it isn't always just about the cash coming in there are so many other points here as you said whether it's in the customer journey whether it's the way they they look at the brand they feel the brand they see the brand just the metrics are phenomenal um so that's all the good stuff um I hate to ask this question but while I have you and you're the expert (laughs) are there any disadvantages do you feel to having a pop-up of course (laughs) (laughs) I mean of course um yes the, as as anything in, in, in retail, you always have uh, the plus side and the downside. I mean, today pop-up stores, um, if, if we're re- reusing this term vulgarized, we think that pop-up stores would come and save the world for us. Yeah. But actually, they don't. And we cannot blame a pop-up store if it didn't yield uh, a positive return uh, from the first time. I mean, first of all, you have to be very aware before starting your pop-up store experimentation that uh, this one-off thingy is not a hit and run. Um, You have to understand that if you want to do one pop-up store due to its ephemerality, customers might might not have the chance to come visit it or maybe access it or get in touch with it. So you have to think that you have to frequently pop up to create a certain effect. Uh, moreover, if you're popping up differently, you need to keep the dynamic. Keeping the dynamic means putting more events, thinking of new things, uh, adding on more novelty. Creativity is expensive, um, and uh, developing that ex- is expensive. It's not expensive as developing a physical store, that we know it. Mm. However, we should not neglect the fact that a good pop-up or a pop-up store that is done in a good way uh, could cost a good amount of money. So this investment has to be carefully thought because we don't want to be throwing our money away. Should we have, again, um, thought well of what objective are we having from our pop-up store? considered the good timing and the good duration, uh, put in the right event, uh, put in the right uh, offering, merchandise or capsule collection, you name it. Whatever you want to do, you have to calculate it well. Because if you want your pop-up store to have a positive effect, it has to be in the right condition, in, in the right micro environment. And this has to be repeated several times because at um, at a certain point, um, remember the basics of advertising? We used to talk about frequency. I mean, pop-up store is a communications tool. And if we don't show customers a certain frequency that will not bore them, of course, keep the dynamic coming, keep them wanting something new and different, they would forget or even did not notice, they wouldn't notice that we did a pop-up in the the first place. So I might really be inclined to say that it costs money, it needs to be frequent, and it needs to always present something new and different. Um, More importantly, we need to make sure that um, our pop-up is an instance that creates good content for us. So before planning our pop-up, we should also plan our communications. This being said, to start maybe raising some teasing campaigns about an upcoming product or uh, a pop-up that is going to present that product, you name it, you have to communicate it. Content is costly, communicating the content is costly, and so on. So there are lots of costs incurred, and we need to be really aware of them because they have to go hand in hand. We have to always plan. So there is the pre uh, phase, there is the during phase, and there is the post phase. And we cannot omit any of the phases. So this means that we have to have the right team, the right dedication, time, and capital related to that. Sometimes it is negative, yes, Mm. but all of this done well would be uh, leading to a positive effect. So we don't want to sell a dream when we're working with pop-ups. I have 
worked with lots of brands who have called in to say like, Khalia, we would like to do this or that. We have this project in mind. And when I explain the truth about developing a pop-up store, they were they are not very happy to listen. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to say like this is the truth about it um but once you once you got in the business of doing the pop-up store right like you get on the wave and uh hopefully you will pick up on positive uh, experiences and results later on Oh, and I'm sure they do, especially if they're coming to you for advice. So look, we know that the retail industry is agile. We, we've spoken about this a bit briefly here, because as you said, you were reading about the first one you came across back just post that kind of 2008 recession. So obviously recently that recession, we've had a bit of a pandemic since then. Um, and then we've had this real emergence and I suppose domination of e-commerce now for the last few years. So looking to the future then, do you think the pop-up store will have helped the industry kind of continue to grow and develop? Like, do you think it's always going to be there? Hmm. Um, actually, we have seen the extent to which um, we read articles around uh, maybe 2014, 15, and up to 18, like saying the high street is... Um, oh, you're dead. That's it, dead. we were all out of jobs, it was over. Yeah, yeah, like physical retail is dead. Like, yes, boring retail is dead. And that 100%. we know it. And then e-commerce certainly replaced a very big chunk uh, of uh, physical retail incapacities in the sense that with online commerce, like done right as well, because online commerce could be done not right. <laughs> Uh, it gave us the possibility to present more merchandise, an extensive catalog, a 24-hour uh, shopping experience, seven-day shopping experience, like you name it. But um, we lacked the physical uh, touch and encounter with our products because customers really like to go out. We are human beings. We want to go out. So... Uh, 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 around 2019 and before the pandemic, we were already raising the question. Now the pandemic came in and it pushed us even to go further with technology and e-commerce gained a greater place in the retail scene. But the physical space also gained a very important uh, place because all of the brands like digital native brands, certainly, and um, brands who were really investing in their e-commerce websites said, I need to come and meet my customers somewhere, somehow. And a physical store would be a great idea. Now, how do pop-up stores come in handy? Pop-up stores are great ways to personify brands that do not have a physical presence, but that need a presence maybe from time to time. Let me explain myself. If you're selling swimming suits, do you need do you need to be on the high street uh, 12 months per year? Maybe not. If you're selling ski, um, like gear, do you need to be on the high street um, uh, all year long? No. So with temporary retailing, um, we say like, let's reinforce on our presence on the high street when it is needed and most relevant to customers. So this is a great thing. And on the other hand, if we have closed down many retail stores, our physical stores uh, could be a really immersive, experiential. We could put forward our new products, maybe capsule collections, collabs, etc., and all of the rest could be found online. Again, with this omni-channel experience, coming into a store today, I could purchase that T-shirt. If I need a basic, I know that I could find it online. I could order it, receive it here, receive it at home, like. The options today are uh, many. And with pop-up stores, we would say, okay, let's push that experience further and not only give our customers a beautiful environment to shop in, let us give him something great. Let's do a rendezvous. Let's meet up with him. Let's celebrate with him. So the pop-up store becomes really a place of celebration, a living place, a conversational place between brands and customers certainly we need to uh, live uh, as brands we need to sell but this does not mean that every pop-up store is dedicated for selling because selling could happen again uh, anywhere at any time and this idea had already been um, elaborated so i believe that 
uh, with that logic, today we understand that e-commerce will always be there, but pop-up stores also complete um, e-com brands and their need to have a personification or a physical presence on the high street. That's a really interesting way of putting it. And I've certainly never heard it like that, but absolutely the pop-up can sit alongside your freestanding, ordinary physical store. It can sit alongside your e-com shop and it's just a marriage of them all. And I suppose really it's about reframing the idea of a pop-up as this truly immersive experiential retail experience, that excitement, that magic that you talked about earlier, but it sits beautifully then along every other channel that a really good brand has. And it's there, as you said, quite simply to meet the customer. And I think it's it's really good to frame it that way. And I think, again, an awful lot of people are really going to start looking at pop-ups differently because now it makes sense, if I'm really honest. It really does make sense. I hope so. I mean, yes, and I have even quoted many times pop-up stores as being place of rendezvous. Like, yeah. what? A, like, imagine you're going on a date at the first time. Like, the excitement you're making yourself look really beautiful you're 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 at your best all the time and imagine how a brand would be every time it's going on a first date with its pop-up store i i wouldn't see it in any other way than that so if brands really understand that i know if brands uh go like away like they they take a little moment and they go away from their old management uh styles i believe that they could really take advantage from operating pop-up stores but you have to have a clear vision and strategy and stop operating from the inside like in silos like we do marketing you do sales we do this we do that we have to really think in a holistic way and integrate pop-up stores into our um, retail strategy Oh, it sounds it sounds absolutely the way forward. And I really hope now people have taken some ideas from today because it's it's just a gorgeous way, as you said, to rendezvous with your customers. So to sum up then, Galia, any kind of key takeaways then for a brand that might be sitting there thinking we're we're midway through the year at this stage, if they were planning a pop up for, you know, for this year, for next year, any key takeaways for them if they're thinking of opening one? Key takeaway, I would always say like prepare, prepare, prepare. It's really important like to research, to prepare, especially if you're doing pop-up stores uh, as a first experience. And might, as, uh, might I add that uh, we learn from doing our pop-up stores and we should not be afraid from moving further and developing and learning every time we do a pop-up store because we should be open to the idea of uh, trying, failing, trying again, enhancing, doing something and going into a different direction. However, I would always insist on the fact of staying true to your brand identity and brand's values. Even if you diversify your pop-up stores and pop-up experiences, they always have to link with a very unique thread. And this thread is that of the brand and its identity. Once you stay on that line, once you have your clear objectives related to each and every pop-up store that you will do, I think that you will be uh, on the right way of investing better uh, in pop-up stores and hopefully having a better customer connection and experience related to your brand. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day, isn't it? So okay. it's, it's, it's such an incredible channel to be able to offer the customer. So look, final question then and I could definitely talk to you all day so you're, you're already booked let's do this again because I've as an educator and as a retailer I've, I've found this absolutely fascinating I suppose yeah final question then what's coming up for you over the next few months well guess what a new book on Papa Retail. oh fantastic <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, Sold. Is, uh, <laughs> thank you actually i think that there's a lot to say about pop-up stores um i have already written uh, two books on pop-up retail that uh, were pretty much academic in their style and their presentation but um after having uh, worked closely and talked uh, with many 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 retailers who worked with pop-up stores i believe that it's the time to uh, reflect these voices into uh, one manuscript that could benefit uh, many other managers and professionals uh, into understanding the reality of pop-up retail Absolutely. and how this could be really beneficial to their uh, brand so hopefully yeah by next year we'll be having the new baby <laughs> 
<laughs> oh well then we, we'll have to watch the space then we'll have to have you back because certainly I think if today it's and this pleasure. last half hour has been anything to go by um I think I'm sure it's going to whet a lot of people's appetites and they're definitely going to want to read more so we'll definitely have to have you back on the retail tea break podcast next year and we'll talk about the book then so if you've enjoyed today's podcast episode please like and share it. There are so many incredible takeaways in today's episode. Remember, you can listen back to past Retail Tea Break uh, podcast episodes on your favorite platform or on YouTube, and then connect with myself on Galia uh, on LinkedIn or follow the Retail Advisor and Galia across social media. And I'm going to pop all the links then in our show notes as well. Um, So Galia, again, I can't thank you enough for today. Um, It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time and thank you for loving retail as much as I do. (laughs) Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.